provocative but very insightful, always insightful speaker from uh, Agile Singapore uh, a couple of years back. And I'm very grateful today for bringing your conferences to Asia, to Australia, and now to Southeast Asia as well. So this is a great effort by Dave and the team, uh, Marlos and everyone else. Um, so you mentioned the next conference will be in September in Singapore. Yeah, that's right. Um, and without further ado, uh, welcome Dave. Can you hear me all right, or do, you, do I need a microphone? Okay. Did somebody say microphone? Okay, all right. I'm used to one of these, not one of these. So. Sorry, Dave. So, um, thank you very much, uh, Titansoft and uh, Agile and Engineering SG, we really appreciate all the support and also uh, our platinum sponsor this year is uh, Credit Suisse. Uh, we're very appreciative that they've decided to support the community and uh, uh, hopefully uh, that means that they're going to be doing a lot of great things at Credit Suisse and uh, uh, I look forward to finding out about that. Uh, we have a couple more Yao Nights. My apologies, we had two, two Yao Nights planned, one for February and one for March. And uh, uh, both the speakers had uh, problems with their schedules and their employers, so uh, we're a little late uh, this year. But uh, uh, our next uh, Yao Night will be on the 29th of May. And uh, Evan Labor, who you may know of because he spent some time in here working on transformations. He formed, formed something called the uh, Business Agility Conference and we're doing the first Business Agility Conference outside of the US uh, in Australia in September. Uh, so if you're interested, Business Agility is basically about agility outside of IT. You know, so how do you change marketing? How do you change HR? How do you change the other business functions and finance and so on? And uh, some of you may know that that's actually uh, required um, because a lot of the problems is that an agile development team uh, is essentially completely confounded if the business uh, doesn't uh, drink the same Kool-Aid. So uh, our next young night is in June and uh, Sebastian von Conrad uh, um, there's a big software architecture conference in the United States called Saturn and last year he won the best uh, presentation award for his work on event sourcing. He's with a new company in Australia called Culture Amp and Sebastian will be here with you in June talking about event sourcing. Uh, we have a conference coming up. Uh, we've announced a good number of the speakers. Uh, First one is someone who's just relocated to uh, Singapore, Gregor Hoppe, who's now back with Google, was the uh, chief architect for Alliance, and uh, uh, he wrote a small book that some people know called Integra Enterprise Integration Patterns, and another one that says 37 things that uh, one architect knows. And uh, Gregor spoke for us la here last year, so uh, some of you may have heard him. Next person is Go Goiko. Specification by example, you may have heard of that. He's got a few other books like Impact Mapping and so on. So uh, he wasn't able to join us in Hong Kong, but he made it to Singapore last year, and ho hopefully uh, we will we will definitely be seeing him here. The next person you may have know of also is a book author called Dave Farley. Uh, you may know the other author of that book is called Jez Humble, uh, Continuous uh, Delivery. Um, so Dave will be here, but. He also talks a lot about high performance systems. Uh, next person is Jeff Patton. You may have heard of him as well. Uh, known for his work on agile products and he has a little book called uh, uh, Story Mapping, which probably many people consider to be one of the Bibles in agile. They'll all be doing workshops as well two days before the conference. So. Uh, and we have Heidi. I don't think many people know Heidi, though some of them may have heard of her. Um, she was at Agile India. She's an expert on dynamic teaming, uh, putting teams together. Uh, 
changing the teams and doing a very, very important activity because many organizations are really bad at team formation and changing and so on. Then we have Michael Nygaard. Uh, he has a, a new version of his book called Release It. Uh, he's a specialist in architecture and DevOps, and very well known, as you know. And then they have some fat old bald guy. And then uh, we've got a few more to be announced. Oh. So tonight, um, this, is, this is a talk which I get asked to give. I mean, I, I'm, there's basically only a few people that talk about legacy because, you know, who wants to talk about legacy? Because, you know, obviously that's boring and no one wants to work on that terrible stuff. And, you know, you know. You know, you want to work on, you know, want to program in Scala or Go or, you know, something exciting. Um, you know, use Kubernetes even though it doesn't work yet, but, you know, you can try it and see where the security holes are for your corporation. Um, so, you know, uh, and the two people that get asked a lot are Michael Feathers, who's a very good friend who I w worked with at Object Mentor. I was a managing director for Object Mentor uh, when Dean Wampler and... Um, Bob Martin and a bunch of characters there. And um, so I, I only do this talk, it sort of comes out of the box every so many years. And uh, this year I was uh, forced to pull it out for Go To Chicago. And uh, unfortunately other people started hearing about it and so they said, would you do it again? So um, I, I do have some, uh, I'm sort of a bit opinionated. Some of you may have heard me before. Um, um, I'm an old professor, so I sort of believe in sort of poking the students, right? So I, I will say many things, um, and you'll have to figure out yourself which ones are true. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but I believe a very large percentage of them. Um, and I think one of the things that that Yao can do is that the people we're bringing are people who have seen the movie. That is, they've actually you know, built a lot of software, made a lot of mistakes, and what we'd like to do is share our experiences with you. So I think the biggest thing that Yao does is bring people who actually uh, have built a lot of software and made a lot of mistakes. And hopefully you will avoid some of those things. I guarantee you, you will make some of the same ones uh, because there's no needle for experience, right? And if you had a needle and you could just say, bend over, I'll give you all the experience I have, that would be wonderful. So, this is just an outline for the talk. I won't bore you taking you through the outline, we'll just get going. I think it's very important. I think everyone knows what a legacy is. The first thing is, it's an application with substantial value. Most companies, I'll pick any large company such as Oracle, have not made money with their new products. They're still making money from their legacy products, the Oracle database, Oracle financials, and so on. Many new companies find out that their wonderful Ruby on Rails tarball that they can't refactor or do anything with is now, after five years, a legacy state. By definition, uh, I consider a legacy basically anything that's gone past three releases without a major rewrite. So if you're on release five, you're on that legacy train with the legacy pain. But it's generating money, and it's really scary to touch. <laughs> yeah. Now, none of you will have that problem, of course. So it's classic, there's no documentation, there's, no, there's, not, well, there's, there's not sufficient documents, lack of tests, there's la lack of knowledge of the code base because the people have moved on or died. <laughs> um, and it's probably in a language that you don't want to program. Everyone likes working in COBOL, PL1, RPG. Just imagine those poor people who have to pick up that JavaScript code you're working on. <laughs> or that Java code. Yeah. So the reason we want to improve, and I'll talk about evolve, uh, and I use that word for a reason and you'll understand. 
what we want to do, first of all, for most people, what they want to do with a legacy is basically improve access to the data. Because typically the legacy system locks the path of access to the data and blocks people from getting easy access. That's the biggest thing they want to do. The other thing is they actually have to change the functionality, either because they want to be competitive for business reasons or because they have to comply with regulatory stuff. It's a major problem in the finance industry. Uh, you know, I'm sure not in your bank, but in other banks, they often sort the backlog by which, which one will get us the, the, you know, the smallest fine. <laughs> oh, there were a few people from banks here. <laughs> um, and the other one is basically because you want to be able to you know, improve the flow, basically you want to be able to do more faster or get real, real time performance out of a system that was never designed for real time. So there are usual solutions for this. Um, uh, and I believe in Singapore, you've all experienced probably all of these solutions. The first one is to give it to someone else, right? Usually in another country. Um, if you're really bad at it, you pick a country that's 12 hours apart from you. Um, and then you, and you have, you know, so that both the people in India and the people in the United States, I'm Canadian, by the way, so you'll see I have a sense of humor, so. Um, you know. So that way you can inflict the maximal pain on both the people in India by having them stay up at a regular time or get up at a really early hour in the morning and the same in the United States, just the opposite time. Um, fortunately, we're learning this is not the way to do things you want to hold. Uh, rewrite it in a modern language. Ah, yeah, that's what I want to do. I'm we're going to redo this system in Go or Scala or whatever your favorite language is. Or, you, know, you know the one you don't know yet, but you're sure you can do it with? F-sharp, I guess that's it. And then the other thing you can do is you can basically uh, sort of take the classic uh, TDD book, and you've got Michael Feather's book, and you, know, you can sit there, and Michael Feather will show you how to work with a small number, like 10 classes, and spend 42 years to get it done. Um, the book is right, Michael's is right, it just does not work because it's just too hard. Now there are examples of systems that have been rewritten. I worked at a company called Xerox. Xerox once made computers. Uh, you may have heard of Xerox Park. That's the place that, you know, there's a couple of books, one called Fumbling the Future. They invented, you know, all sorts of things and none of which they made any money from because they got copied, including the Macintosh and a uh, whole other thing. And Xerox sold its computer business to Honeywell. And they completely rewrote the operating system in a new programming language, rewrote the whole operating system and made it sort of functionally complete. Believe it or not, they also replicated all the bugs <laughs> than with the other previous system. Another one is companies doing microservices. You know, we know about microservices. This is you want a whole lot of processes that are loosely coupled. And one of the classic mistakes in taking a monolith and turning it into microservices is that you get what we call dependency preserving microservices. So even though you've now got it into 20 microservices from one monolith, the dependencies are all there, so you still can't deploy it. It's a very common failure mode for people doing microservices. So there's successful rewrites, but essentially defects preserved. So I want to go this word technical debt because this is the big club that the agile guys bring up, you know. Look, you know there's this thing called technical debt. And if we don't take care of that boss and put some money in there and get some technical debt cards, we're going to be in big trouble. And of course, no one actually looks at the definition of technical debt, which comes from Ward Cunningham. Um, and Ward was basically talking about, he was actually working on a financial system at the time. And uh, actually the financial system that the 
uh, first test-driven development book uh, that Kent wrote, uh, that's actually about the same financial system, so the examples in that um, Kent's first testing book. And basically, the whole idea was that when you're building software, you often don't know what you're doing. Um, that's for sure true in Agile. Um, and so, you know, with, you know, with no design and no architecture, you're guaranteed to make mistakes. Uh, with design and art, some design and architecture, you'll just reduce the number of mistakes, but you'll still make them. So the real question is, how do I do this? Well, in Ward's words, what you do is you write a little code, and then you realize, no, that's not quite right, and then you refactor it. And the technical debt is what builds up in between those refactorings. The point is that Ward was talking about days not weeks or months. And then a lot of people went off and made a big business about technical debt and so on, but it's absolutely not what Ward was talking about. You know, you can't reduce technical debt that's accumulated over weeks or months. Most of the technical debt I see from Agile projects starts because the Agile team is so enthusiastic they do almost no design prototyping up front they go for six to eight sprints and then they beg for technical debt cards, right? And the problem is as soon as you've got a lot of code, you're in trouble. Refactoring. This is another one of the golden touchstones, right? Refactoring works really well for really small programs. There are no serious refactoring tools for a big legacy or for any large amount of code. Uh, move method. You know, moving these, that's not what you need if you're going to do serious refactoring. You need a real meta programming environment, and none exist yet today. I think it would be a great product and be a wonderful thing to work on, but there's nothing. So, but of course, many of you go to your management, and again, you know, we really looked at this, and what we really need to do is we need to do a major refactoring. And you're lying, because what you're going to do is rewrite the entire bloody thing under the guise that it's just a refactoring. Tell me it's not true. It's definitely not equivalence preserving, and you don't have the test to make sure it works either. Oh, but you use that word. How many of you in the project? Here's the project report. We're just going to do a refactoring. It'll take 22 people in 72 months. So, now, one of the favorite things to do for companies is to basically find something that they can make everybody transform everyone. So this could be learn object-oriented. We're going to make everybody this year object-oriented. Or we're going to make them all agile. Or we're going to teach them all to use functional programming. Or we're all going to use containers or whatever. Whatever thing it is, it has to be done in a year. Um, and, you know, we have enough money so we can spray a little on all of you. Now, IBM did 300,000 people in one year and made them agile. It did that by getting them in large groups and spraying them with agile holy water. <laughs> the problem is systematic transformation does very little for people. It takes scarce resources which could be applied to do important things and sprays them around. Right? People do agile and they put Scrum in without any continuous delivery, no technical practices. <laughs> hey, great, how many, you know, the KPI for the MD is how many Scrum Masters they got in a year. You know, the, the MD got paid, nothing happened, but you know. So, you know, the problem is if you make systematic changes or you go, you end up having to tackle a large code base. You have to put all these tests that you don't have this is just a mission impossible. Now, some people succeed, but most people don't. And many of you have been on this project, right? Here's your opportunity. We're going to we're going to do a rewrite of this major system. You know, you'll just be on it for a few months. Ah, sure. So, what I want to talk about is a different approach, and actually, there's a pair talk with this, which was 
uh, a keynote I did at Agile uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and this is what I call targeted value-driven development. And there's no book or anything else coming out on value-driven development. I just knew how I could pick a catchy title. Um, and the key thing here is we want to find simple things that we can do that will give large return on investment. So what we're going to do is essentially do tactical interventions. We're going to go in and blow something up, replace it with something else that adds lots of value. And it has to be targeted because otherwise it'll never succeed. You know, targeted basically is just another way for saying we have to minimize the dependencies because the hell of software is dealing with dependencies. So what we want to be able to do then is choose projects that can be very narrowly scoped and typically I'll claim that most of the interesting things and most of the way to make money doing this and I've been very fortunate to get away with doing a lot of crazy things with new technology working on legacy systems. The challenge is to find a very, very narrow scope. And I'll claim that it's much easier to look at data than it is to look at code. But let's talk with code. And what we want to do is put a small team on it and we want to deliver it in, you know, in a quarter. Nothing new. The other thing we want to do is we want to try and use some trick to make things go faster. When one looks at a factory, I mean, if, if you're a student of lean, and you should be, uh, there's only really one book you have to read. You can read Mary's because it's very motivating. But if you really want to understand lean principles, read Don Reinerson's book called Flow. It'll hurt your head because there's some queuing theory and some other things in it. Uh, almost every person I know had to read it two or three times before they got it. Um, but it's a very, very important book. And hopefully we'll get Don here next year. He had some family issues this year and wasn't able to make it. But, uh, so what we want to do is somehow come up with some clever idea, think out of the box, saying, okay, what could we do to change the game? Because we know if we approach it the conventional way, we're not going to make a difference. We'll just be there with a pick, you know, picking away at Code Mountain. And it'll take us forever. So the first innovation is very simple. Ask the business, why do we have to do it this way? You know, no code approach, right? The best code you can write is zero, right? Never has any defects. Often there are simple changes in the business that you can make that will allow you to make a big improvement. I know there's a the story of the, there's in the United States many years ago, there's ice cream you get in a little cup. They called it sort of Dixie cup, right? And you get the ice cream and take the top off, it's got a little wooden spoon in it. And when the company that was manufacturing this when they first did it, when they delivered the ice cream, they found out <coughs> that when you opened it, it looked like it was half full because the vibration, the ice cream settled. They tried everything. So finally they posted a big reward. Yeah. Very, very large amount of money. If someone can come up with an invention that would solve this problem. And there were many engineers and you know, uh, many food producers and so on that I worked on this. And one guy said, I've got the solution. And they said, they said well, you have to show us. He said, well, you have to sign that I get the, get the money. He basically filled the cup and turned it upside down. <laughs> so the ice cream froze, stuck to the top. Pretty important, satisfied the company. Com customers never knew there was air at the bottom. It still settled, but they shipped them that way. Yeah. Well, that wasn't fun. We didn't write any software, so. The next thing we can leverage is the one thing that's saving software year after year is hardware. Because hardware gets cheaper and cheaper and more capacity um, 
so that we can suck up all this, you know, we basically can burn up the cycles from all the bad software that gets written. Another thing we can do is we can look at using new algorithms, database, cloud, and I put ML in here because if you don't have ML on a slide today, you know, it's not a good talk. So. And then I can look at new software practices. So these are all things that I can actually do uh, to try and make a change. Okay, how do you get management buy-in to do something radical? Because we're going to insert some wild and crazy technologies or some different things in there. You know, in doing this, I worked in programming language you've never worked, heard of, database technologies you've never heard of, um, all of which were very new and very risky. So the first thing is you need a clear, measurable goal. You need to make sure it's something that matters, two million to 10 million or more, or 15% return. If you're doing something that matters, you'll find a business sponsor that actually cares about it and will stand behind you. Most people have no business value on their story cards. Right? They get priority order you know, by someone who hasn't even connected to the business. That's why you need business agility. So short implementation time. The other thing is we want to not impact the day-to-day -day operations because it's so easy you know, to install and have everyone change their production systems. They're very flexible. Like, we like to wreck the schema for you, redeploy in containers. That's really easy to do in a legacy environment. I, mean, I know companies today that basically say, look, we can provision a new VM in a month. That's a feature. They've been working on it for two years. Sorry if I picked your favorite bank. Um, so the technical side is we need a team of good people, good business people and good technical people. That is, people who have experience and basically can work under pressure, because this is always a pressure situation. And not everyone can do this, but it's short. Um, we want to have specialist technical skills. If you're working on a legacy system, and it happens to be something like SAP BW or Oracle Financials, you know, SAP BW, there's billions of tables in there. You know, you could get lost forever if you don't understand the technology. So you need someone who understands that, an expert in that technology, not just someone that's used SAP BW or whatever, it's someone who knows SAP BW inside out. You need the train killer for that particular thing. It's going to be critical. You can't do it just by reading the code yourself or doing something like that. So you need specialist resources. You want localized changes and minimal dependencies. You want a clear, clear service level agreement. I want to be able to measure that what I'm delivering is actually delivered. If I can't measure it, I can't improve it. That's key principle of lean. All right, so I want to be able to measure it. So the first thing I do is what everybody who wants to use a new technology does. They do a proof of concept. Well, often it's called a pilot. Pilot means it's never going to work. Pilot means it doesn't matter. Proof of concept basically says, okay, so I'm going to implement this and I'm going to use, you know, I'll pick, you know, Scala. Because Scala is cool, you know, better than Java. Kotlin's not here yet. Um, you know, so I'm going to try and do this. And you build something pretty quick because you just took, you know, two guys that worked with Martin Nadersky building Scala and they're experts, so they've figured out how to do all this themselves. But the one thing they don't do is the next step. And this is why most new technology fails. Most technology won't handle the pressure. Performance, space, storage. All of a sudden you find out, oh right, I'm new on Scala, but it's running on Java. And Java, oh yeah, garbage collector. Oh yeah, generating functions that turn into objects. Oh yeah. Oh, continuations can't really do that. Uh, functional programming likes continuations. Barf. Does not scale. So scaling is really the thing and nothing goes ahead. The other thing is you want to be able to deploy it right into the system. Ideally what we'd like to do is roll up a little box 
and insert it right in line in the system and just turn the box on, connecting the inputs together and the outputs and do that. Not always that easy. Something I'll talk about, if it's critical systems, independent testing is still considered to be the best practice. Seldom practice except in things like aerospace where it's called IV and V. So if it's selected code focus, you know, this is the stuff where, you know, Michael Feather's stuff is really a good idea, right? Small computational bottlenecks, you can measure it. I just was Martin Thompson in Chicago. You may know Martin, he's a performance expert. He just got asked to go work at a large company, and since it's being videoed, I'll just cut off the rest. Uh, and uh, turns out they were using a, a different programming language, which uh, Martin uh, has never used. So they were very upset that the you know, CEO was bringing in a performance expert for a technology that uh, he didn't know. Um, so I, I'm, the story goes that Martin offered to do it for free because he said, look, if I can't find any problems, don't bother paying me. So he ran, just ran, spun up the standard performance tools, you know, the ones that you're all trained to use because every time you go to a company, they show you how to measure the performance on a simple Linux or Windows machine. You all can do that, right? What's the speed in space, process overhead, memory, network? And he went, oh, can I see the code? And they said, well, yeah, you don't know Python, but yeah, here you go. And he looked at the code, moved something seven lines, and got a 15% improvement in performance. And they said, well, you don't know Python. And he says, no, I don't, <laughs> but it's code. The simple tools were the trick. They gave away the fact that basically there was a whole lot of database I.O. going on and the database I.O. was inside a loop and didn't need to be. Most big performance wins are simple. Do your homework. Another thing that many systems that we have is they have a lot of things that change. It could be a rating engine for insurance. It could be the, you know, you know and they're, classically, these are hard-coded with you know, thousands of if statements or case statements. And you, they're very difficult to modify successfully, and they're hard to test because there's a lot of possibilities. So these are things which you want to change. So the typical things you can do for an insertion point is that if you have something of high variability or some small little hotspot, you can insert a small interpreter it's a small execution engine which works on data, which we call a table. Um, this was best practice uh, when I graduated from university. I would take my nice piece of assembler code, and I'd have all this great you know, you know, branching and everything in there. I thought well organized with nice labels and so on. And, and the people who did this table-driven programming, it was called in those days, uh, would say, looked at me and they said, well, Dave, you know, it's not bad, looks like it's pretty good, but it's completely unmaintainable because we're gonna change, you know, 42 things in here over the time and you'll have to jump all over. And they showed me how I could use one of a number of small table interpreters to do this, plus the space would be a lot smaller and I just have to edit the table. I don't have to redeploy a jar file and try to figure out how to get it running in a container. I can just edit it live. Plus, there's all sorts of techniques for testing these. So these are examples. And you could use DSLs. Um, today, there's one very widely used DSL, Cucumber. How depressing. So I get to write the code twice for something that I could completely automate. I'll come back to that in a second. How much time can you waste doing spec? How about programming by example instead of spec by example? I'll give you some examples shortly. So in my book, most people go after the code. An attacking code mountain is really, really hard. And you have to be really smart to do that. 
and I'm not smart enough to do that. So I look for the lazy way, and typically what I'm looking for is how can I improve the flow in this system? And so the thing that's often most valuable is to actually look for the places where you can add lots of value. And if you actually look, the most important thing in most companies is actually their data. Right? That's, why the, that's why the legacy systems survive. No matter how many bad implementations they are, they still got their data and they can just go, oh, forget it, we'll just go back to the old system. We've got the data. Um, well, yeah, that's before you get Mongo or something like that where he loses the data if you kick the power out. Um, and it's very stable. It turns out that the physical page format for Oracle databases and IBM DB2 has not changed in 30 years. Unlike the code, which has moved around all over the place. So the data is very stable. And the nice thing is most of the transformations that you do on the data, basically you're taking a data source from here over to there, and you're applying just a set of functional transformations. Sorry, I didn't need to use the word functional, they're just data transformations. Right? Um, that's why functional programming is useful. Forget parallel. You know, all the hype for functional programming is about parallelism, but the real value in functional programming is that you're taking, you're doing data transformations. You know, map, reduce, so on. So often these places are the easiest, the other thing they're easy to test and monitor because you've got the data flowing, you can observe it. You can observe the input and you can observe the output. So this is really a sweet spot in my experience for impacting a legacy system. So the places you can do this are any place where data is moving or data is at rest. These are all many of the obvious ones. Um, I actually like it sitting in memory or sitting on the disk, but not many people go there because they think that's really scary. You want to get the data out of Oracle Financials, SAP, BW, and 12 other systems. The fastest way to do it is to read the physical disk pages. Federate them in memory, and you can query them in memory. A bit gutsy though, right? Talking to the SAN controllers. Read block, write block, it's a pretty simple thing to do compared to trying to use the APIs. You know what APIs are, right? Those are things that basically people give you when you whine, and they don't do what you want, right? Right. Here you go, here's the API, but I need these two more fields. Put in another card. So, and another thing is, of course, sync replicate. That's another good way to do it because you get a copy of the data that you can work on with an independent process. And so you can do things in parallel without damage. And for all you people who do do horrible things like use JSON, Please do not use text. Store it in binary, I beg you. It's 10x slower to parse. It's 10x slower to store. And if you put it on an HDFS, it's 30x larger to store. So if you wonder why you're dying with Hadoop or Spark processing CSV files, you should know. You're processing text, you idiots. Get rid of the text as fast as you can. Oh, but I want to be able to read it. You can read 12 billion rows of CSV on the fly. You're smoking dope. Uh, what you should do is have a small little printable program that actually prints it if you want to do that. It's not too hard to write. Um, so, and please, please God, do not make it schemaless. Schemaless means I do not care about anyone working after. Schemaless is a great way to guarantee that no one can ever work on your legacy. Because the schema changes and you can't tell. This is a favorite for people doing UX. Um, UX is like, well, we'll just throw a few more attributes out there. And now the whole data pipeline's broken because in December somebody threw a few more attributes and all the analytics we've been doing are broken for the last four months. So let's look at some legacy patterns. So this goes back to the first one. Um, 
I've got something that's changing a lot. So uh, the first one is a global HR provider. This is, you know, you work for a, a global company and they give you a little card that says, you know, we love you. If you have any problems with your you know, health insurance or anything like that, you just call this number 1-800 and someone answers saying, hi, we love you, uh, but they don't work for the company you work for at all. Uh, they work for this company that's based in Chicago or, you know, Botswana or we don't know where they are. And this company uh, has big mainframe systems that are written, you know, in maybe COBOL or PL1, a language you all want to be able to use. And the problem they have is they have a hundred developers whose job it is to take the latest negotiated benefits package from a national union, and that's negotiated late at night, and that's captured by analysts, uh, very bright people. It's captured in very precise specifications called Excel. And then the 100 COBOL programmers have to, have to take whatever's in those Excel spreadsheets plus interview the analysts and get that into COBOL code. And they're always late. It's a miracle to get it done at all. So what do we bring to the party? We bring small talk. You know, small talk is the easy language. If you don't know, by the way, you know, what a small talk programmer is, that's all the people who wrote the XP books, essentially. And most agile mentors are unemployed small talk programmers. Right? Um, many of them good friends of mine. So. so who do we bring here? We bring small talk, a really fast refactoring, much easier than any other language you can do for an, as an OO language. And later we use Java. Much slower, but you know, in vogue. So we bring Kent Beck. And another bright developer whose name I can. And they bring the latest of, you know, in those days it was called S unit, which happened before J unit. And we trained some COBOL programmers in how to do small talk. And we do the project, and we do the first one, and we end up a whole 10% faster. 10%. Now, fortunately, those two small talk guys were very bright. So just before they left, you know, humbled by their experience, since they believed the tool and the agile practices were the answer, which they weren't, what they needed was an aha, an innovation. That aha was the program has already been written. It's in the Excel spreadsheets. But those spreadsheets are a horrible mess. So one programmer set off to write a spreadsheet checker. It would basically throw up errors every time the analyst pushed the spreadsheet in, every time they did a push, essentially, it would you know, basically come back and say, this is wrong, this is wrong, and the analyst would fix the spreadsheets. The other programmer, while well, that rule checker was being written, wrote a spreadsheet interpreter, which actually talked to the COBOL programs. It's amazing, you know, you, there is something called you know, call, right? And you can actually call a small talk program from a, you know, COBOL program and go the other way. And this is a very dynamic piece that was changing. And they were able to take those hundred COBOL programmers and redeploy them to other projects in the company. This is programming by example, not spec by example. Today I see people with Excel spreadsheets they have something working, or they have a MATLAB or a mathematical model, and they go to the agile developers who basically say, well, what you need to do is you need to encode this, and worst of all, you need to write a whole bunch of story cards for this. And then after you finish the story cards, you have to write the cucumber tests. Uh, because I don't really understand, I don't want to understand your domain. 
Now, you wouldn't do that in Singapore. You'd have you know, programmers that understood the domain and trained them in domain understanding and things like that, assuming the programmers would let you do that. So we've seen this trick. The next one is a commercial insurance provider. 200 million spent to a major consulting company. We know it's got to be Accenture, IBM, or you know, uh, CSC because they just you know, just takes turns which one sort of works you over, takes all your money, you fire them, and then you replace it with one of the other guys, and three turns around they come back. <laughs> I pray that ThoughtWorks gets these jobs because I know they could do a much better job than these other guys do. But the problem here. And so there was a new CEO, CIO come in and says, we've got the answer, it's Agile. And of course, the enterprise architectures came to help because they'd been advised by IBM that what they needed was an uh, a, you know, enterprise service bus. Yeah. We know exactly where to place that. Yeah. And we had an object database. Object database is the first thing to throw off the island, after, and next is the ORM. If, you want to, if you've got a performance problem or a mess, it's because you did naive DDD and put an ORM in. Um, so we have this, the technology's been spec'd outside, you know, rating engines, developed with a different process with people trying to tell the the company that's building the rating engine in India with a waterfall process, how they should be agile and screaming at each other over contracts. Um, yeah, you may have seen these projects. It's almost, you know, it went on and on. There were so many ugly pieces in this. So we were charged as object mentor at the time to come in and basically build the agile team that would build the interfaces on the service bus and then help everybody in the company go agile. We got 12 developers. Said, okay, great. They have any experience? Oh yeah, the other experience. Half of them were hired, they were C-sharp developers and took a Java course the week before, supplied by a contractor. Um, yeah, don't worry, you know, spray, spray them green, they were blue last week. The other, the other people had programmed for most two months in Java. And we're supposed to teach them advanced TDD and how to do this. So at this point, uh, I basically said, look, we're out of here. You know, I know that there's some customers you need to fire early because right? this is going to die. And I, I gave the team, we're leaving, I'm going up to see the CIO, we're out of here. And all of a sudden, Ken said, no, no, no. You know, Jeff and I have been working with all the BAs upstairs. He says, these people are amazing. They've got all the insurance, you know, you know commercial insurance, vehicle insurance, personal insurance, you know, home insurance, all this stuff. They've got it all encoded in spreadsheets. And I said, so? They said, seriously. And I just went up, the spreadsheets scrolled and scrolled. I've never seen that many rows and columns in a spreadsheet. They couldn't be printed. So they said, no, we have a solution. We taught them how to cut the spreadsheets up, modularize them. You can generate all the code for the entire system from the sheets. They're not all spreadsheets in the calculation form. Some of them are decision tables. Some of them are lookup tables and rating rules. These people had been working for 20, 30 years in insurance. They knew the business inside out. But we were going to take all these people and have them write story cards. How retarded can we be? Please, may story cards not be the end of software. This is a classic example. Uh, make it look like the web. You've got a bunch of ugly technology like old process control systems. Uh, you know, maybe you've got an IBM mainframe and it's running something called vSAM files or IMS or some other thing you don't. Turns out that all old systems, whether from DEC or UNIVAC or IBM, now actually journal with atom feeds. So instead of trying to figure out how to run a bunch of APIs and build a whole bunch of services in COBOL or PL1 or whatever, you know, you know, C or you know, whatever you're using, use the atom feeds. 
Now all your Websters can consume this stuff. Very simple trick. APIs. So if you have a system, you know, some people have this system. They, they have an object-oriented database. Very common in manufacturing to have a complicated Boiner connector database. Historically, MRP, ERP systems have very complicated data models. And you can't get any reporting out of it. Well, the easiest thing to do is just put a, an OEM, a ODBC interface in front of it. Then you can just, you know, go at it with SQL, right? Oracle, you know, whatever. Crystal reports or something. Make it look like a collection. This is Eric Meyer's trick. Basically, uh, well, if you know Microsoft Link or RX, essentially you turn everything, everything you talk to, you turn it into a collection, and essentially you apply map map operations across the collection. How many people have a few APIs? You know, good web APIs, you know. How many hundred would you like? Oh, I'm back. I, here's my card. I want the two more fields. Um, and of course, you have to encode it all in ASCII so you can make it push through the wire and you give it a goofy name or some numbers. And then you buy yourself an API gateway so you can try and figure out how to secure it. Uh, and just pile this stuff on top, right? It's the API field of dreams, right? Oh, you need another API. No, it's, it's professional life, right? You know, it's so great about rest, right? Let's have another one. Folks, you need only one API. Select, update, delete. The web should be just seen as a database schema. Now, um, I've been saying this for years and most people consider me a raving lunatic. So I'm now feeling much better since Facebook announced GraphQL. Essentially what you do is you turn your, your entire web of data into a uh, network schema. You can also turn it into a relational schema. And now you can enable that mobile app. You know, what does that mobile app does? It does select of 20 things from 2 billion and puts them on the screen so you can pick three of them and send them back. And for that, I need Kotlin plus this plus React plus da da. Why? Stop building the API field of dreams. Just build select. You do have to secure the select. So there is some assembly required. But you have a single model that you can follow. And now you can actually document what's out there because you can look at the semantics of the schema. You might need to understand what an entity relationship model is, though, because you really have a graph schema. And there'll be many to many relationships, which many object-oriented people don't know about because they don't like data. That's why they use NoSQL databases, because they're too lazy. They just want to stuff everything into a slot so other people can deal with it. Oh, you Mongo guys, I want to kill each one of you. <laughs> so one of my favorite tricks is to use hardware. I mention all the time that if you go to Dell online, you can order a server with a terabyte of RAM, 64 cores, 100 terabytes of storage for $10,000 US. You can do nothing with a programmer for $10,000 US. Once you have a terabyte, a terabyte of RAM is $3,000 is $3, today. And there is something now called NVMe memory, which is persistent memory, which comes in quantities of 10 to petabytes. In two to three years, you're going to be able to get a petabyte in a rack like this. Non-volatile, byte addressable off the bus. Most people don't have more than a few terabytes of interesting data. 
most countries don't have. Facebook, you know, Google, sure, these people do. But you can put data in this zone and then it expands into a petabytes. <laughs> That's right. All you have to do is you know, put, it, put it in JSON. Well, you put it in XML, it'll get even larger, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the problem here is that basically we can take advantage of the hardware. And once you do that, you can do all sorts of things. So we were challenged to build a cyber analytics environment, um, having to deal with cyber problems uh, in NATO countries. Uh, pretty nasty attacks, pretty nasty things going on. This project has happened a few years ago, but it's still, uh, still alive in the customer. So our challenge was, how do you build something that scales from a, an embedded system, like a network controller, up into running in a cloud? And so what we did is we really looked and said, look, the only way we know how to do this is to use memory-intensive technology, you know, stuff that's going to really leverage memory. Because if we can get lots of things in memory, we can query them very, very fast. And we picked a very strange technology for doing that. And if you look at my credentials, you'll find out what that technology is. I don't plan to pimp it to you now. I actually built this and sold it to the company. And now it's called a, a, a product for the company I work for. But it allowed us to do things that nobody else could do. And it still runs 100x faster than Spark on a single box. So once you use the power of the machine, and if you look at any Martin Thompson's work on performance, if you put hardware in, you can build things that are very, very quickly, and you can deal with billions of packets. Another thing is, maybe your dad or your granddad, he had a book called Gain and Sarson. It was called, you know, there was a time called Data Flow Programming. This was kind of in the 70s, towards the 80s. And they had all these little processes, and these processes communicated to other little processes with messages. Microservices. This is Fred George in the first implementation of microservices, or one of the first, no one knows who the first. In modern times, was done at a company that sells power utility, sells utilities uh, power over a market. Uh, called Forward Technology in the UK. And if you look at Fred's work, almost all the things he does use simple data flow one way. This is the easy way to do microservices. It's a very natural model. If you decide that you want microservices that are asynchronous and communicate back with each other, and you have to do this, then you need to go and become like Todd Montgomery and Martin Thompson and find out how to build asynchronous state machines and debug them. So you can do simple microservices based on data flow easily. Pub sub, put some kind of message bus in there, you know, could be Kafka, could be whatever you want, MQ, Rabbit. The other thing we want to do is le leverage immutable data. Uh, You've heard of the Lambda architecture? Big data folks. Nathan Mars. You know, invented, you heard of Topics, Kapka. Well, the first Lambda architecture was the official airline guide done by Arthur Whitney in 1979. Microservices, Topics, PubSub, Lambda architecture have been used for 30 years in the financial industry. They are the essence of how people do high performance, uh, you, know, you know, all those bad things, swaps, derivatives, uh, all those things that take the world's money and make it crash. Um, so the nice thing here is basically the world's very simple. What you have is all the things that happened yesterday that's called the historical database, or in Lambda, it's called the batch database. And it's immutable, so all you do is append to it, essentially. And then you have all the things that happened since. That's the real-time database. And if you want a consistent state, guess what? You do a query that queries two databases, the stream 
and the batch. And you're always guaranteed a consistent answer. You don't, no Paxos required, no complicated algorithms. And typically, you take from the real-time database and at the appropriate intervals, typically uh, in the financial system, financial world is a few hours every night, and you basically append the real-time database to the batch database. An amazingly scalable technology. And you can make copies of these databases. And remember now, when you have 10 terabytes or 100 terabytes of memory on your PC, because you're going to, why are you even moving to the cloud? You can give every quant in the business or every data science in the business a copy of all the data. And you're going to move it to the most expensive place to use storage in the world, the cloud. OS2 is cheap. It's also inexpensive. Maybe you want to think where the technology is going. You know, maybe you don't need all that stuff. Maybe you just need a little decent hardware. This is a solution that's been used in capital markets for many generations very successfully. I mentioned that one earlier. Um, I do want to talk about testing. How many people, I, I, I tried this every year. How many people are now doing property-based testing? Thank God. Folks, this is the best practices in testing. It's been commercially in use for five to seven years. Please learn about it. Please, please learn about it. You know, one property-based test is like writing a hundred or 10,000 unit tests. There you go, there's some motive. It's back practice. There's something called Quick Check. It's available for almost every language. Uh, we had a nice talk uh, last July on the subject. Um, it's all, all done with the examples are all done in Scala, but most people can read Scala because it looks it's pretty straightforward. Most it's not obfuscated by type signatures or anything like that. It's straightforward. Um, if you look up the video from last July, you know, property-based testing is way way better than simple TDD. You know, come on, agile guys, get out of the rut, learn something new. It's time, right? Agile is now 20 years old. You know, you know, unit test, we did, S-Unit was in the 1980s. And you can't move on? Scary. But even more important is an independent implementation or validation. That is a team which, a separate team, which writes some or all the code, so you're actually writing the code twice. Way better than pair programming, right? Yeah. You're getting two implementations as opposed to one mixed up implementation with the pairs. Right? I'm being unfair. Pair programming is a very good technique. Um, this is best practice in things like aerospace and so on, where things have to work because you're using independent brains in the problem. If you look at people like Eric Meyer and Brian Beckman, they do it their own way. What they do is they write something that's algorithmic, they write it in Mathematica, and then they write it in C Sharp. That's how Link was built. So again, two implementations of the same code, either by one person or by separate teams. And the example here, um, in a previous life, I was given the job of moving uh, a large number of databases from many companies to a different database vendor. This is called database restructuring uh, uh, or refactoring, as some people might know, because it is in equivalence preserving. Now, most people, do, some of you know about this because you've had to take log files out of Oracle and wait for the log to come out, and it takes forever to try. That's one of the great things. Once you put something in SAP VW Oracle, you know, it's never going to give it back to you. Or oh, did you know that Amazon charges you money to take your petabytes off? You didn't know that? I just had a customer have a quote of 10 million to move their data off. So 
The problem here is how can we move all these databases but move them quickly? If you're actually going to query all those things, it's going to take you forever to do that. And then you'd have to update, so you'd have to write all possible programs to do this. Now it turns out there's a very simple technique which not many people know, and that is take the physical data and move the physical data first. So just move all the physical pages, page per page, and produce the pages in a new database format. This actually went from a network database to a relational database, but it doesn't matter, it works for any trick. In the end, you've got instances of records that have to become instances of records with the bytes swizzled around in some way and the EBCDIC converted to ASCII or whatever else you have to do. And maybe you're gonna split some records or something in them. It turns out you can do that at disk speed. You can basically just copy and transform the pages. Now the bad news is there's no indexes and all of it's an unconnected mess. Well, it turns out that if you understand anything like linking loaders, you can actually, in one pass with a sort, go back and batch patch all those things because you can know the connection structure from one side and the index structure from, one, from the old system and then you can flip that and then you can just apply it in a sort merge to update the database. Because this is tricky, because you're working at the physical page level, which scares the daylights out of many people, uh, I love it because it's so simple, um, we had an independent group write the validation and they independently wrote something to verify the data coming from the source, match the data that got laid out in the target. Independent validation is still a really good best practice. And for systems like this where you're making critical system changes, look, we have a guest performance right? or attention. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Too bad, I missed all the bad jokes. <laughs> so I'll stop here. I've gone on too long. And uh, uh, it's time for a beer, obviously. Um, thank you very much for your time. I hope you got some ideas. Um, and clearly, Many of the things I said are, can't be true, so if I stepped on your favorite technology, which I hope I did, um, now just think about things. Try and keep things simple. The key thing in all the things here is basically they involve the idea of being really lazy and trying to figure out, you know, if I'm, my job is to program 150 spreadsheets by writing story cards and cucumber tests, I'm going to go out of my freaking mind. So maybe I could write a simple interpreter, or I could provide a way for the user. Maybe I can take MATLAB program. If the user can construct an example, let that example not be a specification. Let it be a program that can run. And validate that program first, because it will have bugs in it. Uh, check it, and then move on. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, look forward to talking. Uh, if somebody has a burning question, I'll take it, but it's like, oh, go ahead. Go. They probably need to write a question to an user story card. <laughs> <laughs> so, I uh, actually agree with like, most you say, but uh, there are like big bots here, so I can see like sort of like an entire speech that uh, we all live in the real world. And you suggest generally like uh, get a bunch of talented people, like really talented people, like engineers, uh, business people. Uh, <laughs> And the apply common sense, it's like basically what you say, but it's like it's a fairy tale. Where you get all the talented people who use common sense instead of media bugs to solve problems? That's a great question. First of all, I don't need many, most organizations don't have that many really talented people. And so the question is do you spread those people around so they can get very little done in 20 places? Or do you actually say, look, I want to win in this case and I have to get a business value and deliver it? And the answer is this works. Uh, and you do, you do two or three projects and you build more and more teams. And so you get increased capability. You don't need, I'm, it's a small team that does this. You're talking about five, six people that are doing these kind of interventions. We're not talking about large teams. There are never enough programmers because Google is going to the 
other planets to find them. But, you know, uh, I think the answer is there's enough to make a lot of big difference in organizations. And if people applied these techniques, they can do a lot more for their organizations than many of them can do now by being spread over teams, applying a whole lot of techniques that don't involve any innovation and so on. So, you know, it works, it can be done, it's not a fairy tale, um, but it, take, it takes leadership and it takes the ability to understand and absorb risk. It also, you also have to be prepared to fail. I mean, you know, I've, I've got thrown out. So we also need uh, leaders, not just engineers, but also leaders. Everything. It's like more and more requirements to make it successful. Like you need our people that are the leaders. Most companies have talented leaders. They don't have a lot of them. And the question is, what's your choice? Am I going to target and deliver value for the things I can deliver? Or am I going to dilute myself and try and be under the delusion that I can spread these people all over the place and get things done? And my experience is that basically if you take your, any business I know takes their key resources and they invest them and say, we're going to put our talented resources here to solve this particular problem. And they solve them by doing them. That's called tactics and that's how you win in business by getting things done. If you do systematic change, you spread these resources over and you believe in the tooth fairy. Leadership is scarce in everything. There's no doubt about it. But it does exist. The real issue is that you have to be able to work on things that are important enough and have enough value to the business so that they'll do this. If you're picking on some problem that doesn't matter or just listening, you have to be able to talk to the business and do that. You know, I understand that some people can't do that, but lots of people do. Lots of talented developers don't take on the understanding of what the business problem is. You know, they want to push a technology or do whatever it is, which is fine. I respect that they want to do that. But if you want to make an impact in the business, the business wants to see things get done every quarter. So if you can't figure out how to make a difference in the business every quarter, you're really not important to the business. Yeah. So make yourself relevant. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to shout you <laughs> But I, I do think it's often the case that, well, you know, I'm waiting for the leader to come, right? Uh, like yeah, yeah. It's just like not enough to the people for like every legacy project that needs to be changed. But that's always true. There is never enough resources in the world. So what you have to do is, no, so you have to figure out what to do with the resources you have. Businesses are successful because they manage the resources they have and use the people they have to do the job. Yeah. Some of those people can do the heavy lifting, other people make other parts work. They try and take advantage of that. When we do this, we always have some young people in the team, some people who haven't, so every project that succeeds, there's a few more people who learn more to do this, right? Which is, I'm sure, the same way that you do things if you go to a new technology, a new way of work. You have some young people, you take those, you split the team, you seed two teams. It, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes five years to, take, you know, to get an uh, organization from anything to be able to produce decent software. Five years of constant effort. I'm not actually seeing that often. That's why I say like, it sounds like a fairy tale. This good leadership is like too scarce to be viable, like, to be able to rely on. I mean, it's not your personal experience. It's not really a question. Like, so. yeah. I mean, you know, in the end, some people, you know, look, if you have to work with idiots, you go someplace else, right? I mean, you know, I can't help that, right? I mean, you know, basically, you know, I mean, my view is very simple. If, if the people you're wor working with you're not learning from, basically, if you're the best in the organization, get out. <laughs> you should go someplace else whether you should learn. Because then you're the superhero, but you're not learning. Right? And then you're going to get very frustrated. But, you know, but, you know, obviously, you know, no one can fix the world. No one can solve all the legacy problems. But in the end, business is about triage. It's about basically, what can I do to make a difference in this? And if you can get to the business leaders with a problem that you're going to save them, you know, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars or cost or improve the reliability of the system, you'll get their attention. But you'll have to stand behind it and be prepared to absorb the risk of doing it and guarantee it'll work.
Anyway, I, I, I won't belate this any longer. I think that's probably a, a, good, time to a end. good time to end it there. Thank you very much, Dave, for your talk and sharing your insights.